We welcome you once again to our video Bible study lessons. We're glad that you could join us as we continue our study in the book of 1 Timothy. We are considering the instructions that Paul gives to the young evangelist Timothy. And we're in the last section of the book as we have looked at uh, the various instructions that he's given, in, beginning especially tonight in chapter 6 and verse 11. We've discussed the various groups of people that Paul has given instructions. He's told Timothy how to teach about the elders, about the deacons, about the older men and women, the younger men and women, and in particular about the widows. He's given instruction about the relationships between servants and masters and instructions about false teachers. But as we have continued the discussion of false teachers in the first part of 1 Timothy chapter 6, led into a discussion of contentment because he had talked about the fact that the false teachers, one of their characteristics, was that they viewed godliness as a means of gain. That is to say, they viewed uh, religion as a way of their own prosperity, their own benefit, rather than using it uh, as service to God or to help those who they were trying to teach. They used it rather as a means of their own uh, gain. And so Paul then uses that as an opportunity to begin a discussion about godliness with contentment. And he said in verse 6 that, that is true gain. And so we discussed last time the importance of being content, that is being satisfied with what we have physically. That doesn't mean that we don't want to improve our circumstances if we can, but rather the point is that we are not continually upset, uh, anxious, worried, complaining uh, in, in order to have something better, but we're willing to accept our circumstances uh, and please God in whatever circumstances we find ourselves. In contrast to that, in verses then uh, 9 and 10, he talks about those who desire to be rich and how that they fall into temptation and snare and many foolish and harmful lusts. And then as a result, they may be led astray from the faith because of their greed and they're pierced through with many sorrows. These were some of the things we studied in our last lesson about the consequences of greed or the love of money. And as we pointed out then, the passage does not say that money is the root of all evil. It says the love of money is the root of all evil. Many people are too attached to wealth, prosperity, material possessions, which is their desire. But now as we continue in the study into the next section, uh, Paul instructs Timothy what he ought to pursue rather than pursuing wealth. And so let's read the verses and then we'll continue in our discussion. So beginning in verse 11, let's read uh, verses 11 through uh, 15. But you, O man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I urge you in the sight of God who lives, gives, excuse me, who gives life to all things and before Christ Jesus who witnessed the good confession before Pontius Pilate that you keep this commandment without spot, blameless, until our Lord Jesus Christ appearing. And that led us to verse 14. Notice in verse 11 that Paul gives Timothy instruction about things he should pursue. That contrasts to what he read before, or said before in the earlier verses, about what he should avoid. So on the one hand, he should avoid uh, the love of money, and the desire to be rich with all the problems that it would create. Instead, he should pursue righteousness, godliness, and so on. So you may consider it as someone who is fleeing from one thing in order to seek something else. He is fleeing from the love of money with all of its consequences, and rather pursuing uh, righteousness and so forth. So let's look at some of the various terms that he uses. Rather than being so concerned about money, what we ought to be concerned about is, first of all, Righteousness. Righteousness in Scripture 
refers to a right standing before God. One who is righteous is one who, whose life is acceptable before God because he's right before God. Uh, one can be right before God by obeying the teachings of God's word. The problem with that is that none of us do that as we ought to do. In order to truly be righteous before God, on that basis, we would all have to live without sin. But all of us do sin, and so we need righteousness from some other means. The other means that God provides is righteousness by means of forgiveness through the blood of Jesus Christ. That's the righteousness that we pursue. But to receive that righteousness, God requires us also to be dedicated to serving God faithfully. In other words, the righteousness that comes by faith in Christ is righteousness that is based on forgiveness, but it also requires us to repent of our sins, to have faith in God enough to be willing to seek to serve him and do his will, honoring him in our lives. Not that that earns salvation, but nevertheless, it's essential in order for him to be willing to forgive us and to give us the hope of eternal life. So we pursue righteousness. In fact, Matthew 6 and verse 33 tells us, that we should seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That should be the most important thing in life to us. And then he continues, saying that we should pursue God in this. Now, a number of the things that he's telling us to pursue here are things we've already discussed in the study of First Timothy. So we'll not spend a lot more time on them. We'll simply remind ourselves of what we have already discussed. Not only pursue righteousness, but we pursue godliness. Godliness refers to a sincere respect and concern for God. In other words, a godly concern, a person is someone who is truly seeking to please and honor God. He is, his mindset is a spiritual mindset in which he seeks to please, please God, as we talked about this in chapter 4, verse 7 and 8. Then it discusses, furthermore, that we should seek in faith, pursue faith, and we discussed this also in chapter 4 and verse 12, was one of those qualities that Paul told Timothy that he should be a good example to the believers in regard to his faith. Uh, faith, of course, is trust in God, which leads us to obey. All of these that he discusses relate to obedience in one way or another because righteousness requires obedience. It requires a godly concern for God. It requires a faith, but a faith in the Bible, in the New Testament, is always an obedient faith. We're not talking about faith alone without obedience, but faith that leads to obedience to God. And then he talks also about love. Now, the love that he describes, again, is concern for the well-being of other people. But biblical love always leads to obedience. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And so, again, this was discussed here in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 12. So we've talked about that one also as essential for our salvation that we must love God and love other people. And this love must lead us, lead us to obey, that we may please God, that he can forgive us of our sins and grant us righteousness. But then the next characteristic that he says we should pursue is patience. Now, patience refers to steadfastness, continuing in faithfulness despite the hardships of life, Despite temptations, despite opposition, persecution that we may face from those who would tend to lead us astray from the truth, uh, the fact that people may be indifferent to the gospel and, and so forth, those things may tend to hinder us. But the patient person is the one who pursues righteousness, godliness, and so on, despite these difficulties and hardships. Now, this area is especially difficult for those who preach the gospel like Timothy because it's so easy to become frustrated when we try to teach people the gospel when they're not willing to accept it. They may uh, resist it. They may have been led astray by false teaching. And so it's easy for us to be tempted to abandon the work of teaching the gospel to others because of the difficulties we face. But Timothy was instructed by Paul to pursue patience. That is, to continue to teach the word and encourage people to do what's right. And that's what we need as well in order for we're going to be pleasing to God. Then the next thing in the list that he lists is uh, gentleness. Now, gentleness is translated in various ways depending on your translation. 
But some translations translate this word as meekness. And the problem that we have is that neither the word gentleness nor meekness carries to our modern minds what the scriptures have in mind with this word. The basic idea of this meekness is a submissiveness, a spirit of willingness to subject our own will to the will of God, so that we're willing, rather than insisting stubbornly on our own way, we're willing to submit to God's way and do his will. Uh, but that then in turn leads us to be willing to, submissive, to be submissive to, to people, not to the sense of allowing them to lead us to disobey God, but to submit our will to proper authority, human authority, even in this life, uh, but also to be willing to submit our will for the good of the group, the good of the local congregation, the good of our family, and so on. So a person who is not meek is often self-willed, stubborn, determined to do things their way. That kind of attitude uh, will lead us astray from God, and so what we need is a gentleness, a meekness that leads us, first of all, to seek the will of God, and then, because we seek the will of God, rather than pursuing what we want, we pursue what is good for other people around us. And so this leads us, then, with love for God and love for truth, love for mankind, uh, not egotistical, not seeking our own way, but a desire to do the will of God. All of these things together, then, Paul said Timothy should pursue, and of course, then we also should pursue, in order to uh, honor God, to please him, rather than pursuing love of money and uh, the desire to be rich. But Paul goes further than that. He then also says not only that we should pursue the righteousness and godliness and so on, he tells Timothy that he should fight the good fight of faith. And in so doing, we may lay hold, he said, of eternal life. Now, as an evangelist, uh, a preacher of the gospel, Timothy was responsible to stand for the truth in opposition to error. That's where the letter began. And we'll see that's where the letter to Timothy ends as well in a few verses. It began with a warning to oppose teaching that is different from the doctrine of Jesus Christ. We need to understand. Teachers of the word need to understand, but we all need to understand that we are involved in a great and a serious war, spiritual warfare, not physical, spiritual. Ephesians chapter 4, excuse me, chapter 6, verses 10 through 18, describes this warfare, talking about how that we wrestle against, not against flesh and blood, but against the spiritual host of wickedness in high places. And it describes how that we should take on the whole armor of God and do battle then against the forces of Satan. And if we do that, we can be successful, we can be pleasing. So the Bible does not describe fighting as something contrary uh, to the nature of a Christian always, depending on what it is we're fighting for and how we're fighting. We don't fight physically, but we are, that is physical harm to other people but using the weapons that God provides, according to Ephesians chapter 6, uh, the weapons that protect us from evil, of righteousness, faith, and so forth, uh, but also the short sword of the Spirit. And in that way, we do battle against false teaching, uh, false practices, and those who would lead astray uh, servants of God. So again, back to chapter 1, he talked about some men in the church where, in Ephesus, where Timothy was, that were leading people astray, uh, and how that he was to oppose that error, and likewise we should do the same today. And once again, then, he says, furthermore, that something else that Timothy should remember to pursue is uh, the fact that he was called with a good confession. First, well, we continue, he, he says that he was called to eternal life uh, and have confessed a good confession in the presence of many witnesses. And this idea of the good confession. Confession, of course, simply means stating that we recognize something 
Uh, we accept it as being the truth, and so we acknowledge it. We confess it. But this is a particular confession. This is not just any confession. This is what Paul calls the good confession, and he calls it that again in verse 15, um, excuse me, verse 13, where he says, Christ Jesus himself witnessed the good confession before Pilate. So we need to understand this good confession and what it involves. And in particular, I would like to point out that this is something that Timothy did in the past. He said, you were, were called to eternal life and have confessed the good confession. Past tense, you were called, you have confessed this good confession. Now, 2 Timothy, excuse me, 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 14 says that we are called to salvation through the gospel of Jesus Christ. So Paul was called, Timothy was called to eternal life by the gospel, which is how we're all called to that eternal life. And it was a message teaching him about being forgiven of sins, how to become a child of God, how to receive forgiveness. And then he confessed a good confession. Now, confessing is something we should do throughout our lives. We confess Jesus Christ. And there are many scriptures that talk about it. It is surprising how often we read about people confessing who Jesus was. And the reason it's so important, and we read about it so often, is because, in fact, it is a, uh, a requirement uh, of a child of God, to be willing to confess who Jesus is. And so, for example, in uh, Matthew chapter 3, and verse 16 and 17, and again in Matthew 17 and verse 5, we find God the Father himself confessing Jesus. When Jesus was baptized, he said, this is my beloved son. Same thing on the Mount of Transfiguration. This is my beloved son in whom I will please listen to him. So God confessed Jesus. That's the good confession. And many, many times during Jesus' lifetime and afterwards, we read about people who were confessing Jesus as the Christ. John confessed him to be the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Uh, the people in uh, Samaria confessed him to be the Savior. John chapter 4, verse 42. Uh, the blind man that Jesus healed in John chapter 9 confessed him. And so on we can go through the New Testament with people confessing who Jesus was. That's the good confession. We're not talking here about confessing sins, although there are times when we need to do that, uh, or we might not be talking about confessing other things that may be even true things or good things to say. But this is a particular confession. It's a confession about who Jesus is. That confession is required in order for us to become child, children of God. We read about the Ethiopian treasure in Acts chapter 8 who confessed that confession before he was baptized. And in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, we're told that with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And so confessing Jesus Christ is essential as a condition to being saved from our sins. So I understand then that this is the confession that uh, Timothy made when he uh, was, became a Christian, just like the Ethiopian treasure. Uh, all those who seek to become Christians must confess Christ. So to become a Christian, you learn the gospel of Jesus Christ. You believe in Christ, who he is. You repent of your sins. You confess Christ, and then you're baptized for the remission of your sins, Acts 2, verse 38. So confession is required then. But actually, except for baptism, all of those steps are things we should continue throughout life as well. We continue to study and learn the word of God. We continue to believe in Christ and to grow in faith. We continue to repent of our sins as we need to. And we continue to confess Christ as we have opportunity from time to time. So the good confession is not something you do just once, but it is necessary to confess who Jesus is before we become Christians, before we're baptized into Christ. Now, what we want to understand then, the passage says, is that Jesus Christ himself also witnessed this good confession before Pilate. That's in verse 13. We may say, well, when did, how did Paul, in his description, what was he referring to? When he talks about Jesus confessing the good confession before Pilate. Well, if you go back to Matthew chapter 27, as Jesus was on trial before Pilate, in verse 11, 
It says, Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said to him, It is as you say. Now that expression, it is as you say, has a, a connotation that uh, may not quite strike us at first because of different translations translated different ways. Uh, some translations say, uh, Thou sayest. But the meaning is, it is just as you say. What you say, that's, what it, that's what's true. Jesus confessed the good confession to Pilate when Pilate asked him if he was the king of the Jews, and Jesus, in essence, said, yes, he was. It was, a, it was a affirmative. He was affirming it true that he was the king of the Jews. Now, the interesting thing about that is that confessing Christ by this good confession uh, it's not simply a matter of a formula, a set formula of certain words that we say. What it is, is an affirmation that we accept Jesus to be who the Bible says he is. That we accept him to be the Son of God, the Christ, the, that is the Messiah, the uh, Savior who died on the cross for our sins, and the Lord whom we must serve faithfully. We're accepting all that about him. So it's not just words that we mouth or even words that we believe, but it's a commitment. It's a devotion that we will be, that we're saying we are willing to be what he wants us to be. We recognize him as the Lord. We recognize him, therefore, as the one whom we ought to serve and stand uh, faithfully and follow him as our master, that we are his disciples. That's why it's essential before becoming a child of God. So we make that confession based on the faith that, of who he is, uh, and based on our repentance, our determination to serve him, and then we're baptized, immersed in water to receive the remission of our sins, Mark 16, 16. Uh, and we are then followers of Jesus Christ. We are Christians. We have received forgiveness of our sins. Jesus made that confession, even as all these other people and many others that we've talked about made that confession. Jesus made it before Pilate. We need to make it before we're baptized, like Timothy did, and we also continue to make it throughout our service to God whenever we have opportunity to confess who Jesus is to those around us. Now, as the verses go on, verse 14, not only does Paul remind Timothy that he had made this good confession, even as Jesus did, he urges him, he said, to keep the commandment without spot, verse 14, blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ appearing. Paul is beginning to come to the end of his instructions to Timothy here. Uh, he's wrapping up, you might say, the teachings that he's given. And in doing so, he's basically say, reminding him of the commitment he made when he became a Christian and in, in, in urging him to remain faithful. Don't be led astray by love for money, by the false teachers, by the doctrine that's not true, and so forth, uh, but maintain the commandment without spot. That is, without being uh, led astray into sin, without false teaching, and so on. He's keeping it blameless until the Lord Jesus comes. Now, that word blameless, of course, we've already studied before. We talked about the elders and the deacons back in chapter 3, that they were to be blameless. And again, we understand that uh, that does not mean that we will live a sinless life, because none of us do, but blameless in the sense that we repent of our sins, that Jesus can forgive us. However, it's interesting to me that Paul instructed Timothy to keep the commandment without spot. So that's our goal. The goal is not to sin and be forgiven, even though we know we need that, the goal is to live without sin, to live above sin, to seek God's will. Why would God require that if it's not possible? So far as I can see, living above sin is something that Christians should seek as our goal. And there's no excuse for us when we fail. We all do fail, but the point is it's in inexcusable. That's why it's proper for God to punish us if we fail and won't repent. Because we ought to live faithfully for him, but as Timothy was instructed to do, and if we don't live faithfully as we ought to, God will forgive us. But, so 
what he's instructing Timothy here is to repent of his sins, uh, to seek forgiveness and faithful life, stand for the truth, not be allowed, uh, allowed sin to lead him astray, but to do the will of God faithfully. Now then, let's read a couple more verses before we go on. Verse 15 and 16 here in 1 Timothy chapter 6. The scripture says, which he will manifest, talking back about the Lord Jesus Christ appearing, which he will manifest in his own time. He who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, dwelling in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to whom be honor and everlasting power. Amen. Now back in chapter 1 and verse 17, we read where Paul had broken into this, uh, what we call a doxology, a statement of praise to God. That's what that word simply means. And Paul does this from time to time in his writings. He's talking about various things, and, he's, and then he just breaks out into this praise of God. God is like this. He describes God. And we ought to remember to appreciate who God is. The reason we serve God is because of who God is, because of his greatness. He deserves our worship, our service and so on. And so here's the expression here that this Jesus Christ, he says he's going to come in his time. He will be made manifest and is revealed, made known. When the time comes, he's going to come again. We don't know when the time is. It's his own time. When he decides, when God decides for it to happen, then it's going to happen. But this one who we're talking about then is described then as the blessed and only potentate the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now, potentate is not a word we use very frequently today, but it simply means a sovereign ruler. Uh, why does it call him the blessed and only potentate? Because there's lots of different rulers. We have rulers still today. Various kings and so on, and civil rulers and so on. The point here is, it says he is the blessed and only potentate, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That is to say, Jesus Christ uh, rules above all. The book of Revelation describes him as the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. In other words, there are other kings, but he's the king over all of them. There are other lords, but he's the Lord over all of them. He's the blessed and only potentate as the highest king, the highest Lord, the one above all others. And so many scriptures describe God and Jesus in that way. Roman, Revelation 19, verse 16, and chapter 17, verse 14, and so on. So Timothy should serve God, and so should we, because he's the ruler over all, the king of kings, the Lord of lords. But then he says, he alone has immortality. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means that he is uh, not only the ruler of all, the king of kings, but that he is eternal. God has all, uh, immortality simply means he cannot die. God will never die. He has lived, existed from eternity in the past, and he will exist in eternity in the future. So he's the blessed and only potentate, the king of kings and lord of lords, and who, he has immortality. Now we may say, well, how can he have only be the only one with immortality when we ourselves are destined to exist forever. Now, we know that's true. Our spirit will always exist. The Bible describes uh, the fact that uh, when he comes again, we're going to be judged. Jesus comes again, we're going to be judged. We're going to receive eternal life or eternal punishment. Uh, so he is the ruler over all, and he's going to judge us. So we're going to exist forever in one state or another, but the word immortality means incapable of dying. If we're immortal, we cannot die, but we know that in fact we are capable of dying. The spirit will exist forever, but if 1 Corinthians chapter 15 explains that at the resurrection is when we put on immortality because our spirit returns to our body. The body is raised from the dead. It's a bodily resurrection. And now we put on immortality. So at this point, we are mortal in the sense that our body can die. 
Our spirit will always exist, but it will separate from our body. But the resurrection, it will return, and then we will be Im immortal. So at this point, it's simply saying that God alone is immortal, and God has always been in existence, and he always will continue to exist. And so in that sense, God alone possesses immortality. And of course, there's many scriptures that affirm this uh, eternal nature of God. Then it says that he dwells in unapproachable light. And again, these are terms that are often used to describe for God. Not only is he the source of life, immortality, he's also the, sort of, the true source of light. Uh, he is so bright and so powerful. The scripture describes him that his dwelling place of heaven is described in the book of Revelation, chapter 22, verse 5, that he's the source of light. They don't need a sun in heaven, that is S-U-N. They don't need a source of light. God is the source of light. He is light, unapproachable. Light, of course, is often used in Scripture as a symbol of truth, righteousness, holiness, and so on. God is the source of all of those things. And so he dwells in unapproachable light, the Scripture says. And then it says that no man has seen him and no man can see him. Now, again, we have to understand these terms in terms of other things the Bible says. Certainly when Jesus was on earth, people could see him. That was when he was as a man. He came to earth as a man, and he could be seen. He came to earth so he could die on the cross to forgive us of our sins. But the fundamental nature of God from eternity, and now even Jesus, having gone back to heaven, we can't see God. We can't see, never could see the Father or the Holy Spirit. And we could only see Jesus when he was on earth. Uh, but he's an invisible God. This is a problem for some people because they want a God that you can see. And that's why many people worship idols, something you can see, uh, something physical. But the true God, the true Lord, the one who is the only potentate, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the one who alone has immortality and dwells in unapproachable light, you can't see him. We walk by faith and not by sight, Second Corinthians 5 says. So this is the one whom we honor. It says in verse 16, you can't see him, uh, but honor and everlasting power belong to him. <clears throat> now let's go into verse 17 through 19 and observe there the instruction, the teaching about to the rich. Excuse me. <coughs> verse 17 through 19. Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Let them do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to give, ready, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. Well, now we have instructions given to those who are rich. Now, it's interesting as we go back to remember verses 9 and 10 and the verses around them that Paul gave instruction uh, that we should not seek to be rich, we should not love money, but rather be content. Here we see that he's not saying that it's wrong to be rich, rather he's giving instructions to the rich as to how they should use their wealth. So being rich of itself is not wrong. The problem that many people have is that they desire rich, which is they want, they seek with a, a, a love, a devotion that leads them to those problems that he described back in verses 9 and 10. He describes some more problems here that can come from the, to those who are rich. He says, don't be haughty. And the idea of being haughty, of course, is proud, high-minded, egotistical. Well, why would sometimes people be uh, haughty because they're rich. Well, sometimes people think that they deserve to be rich. They think they've earned it themselves. They think that that makes them more important than other people, that other people should submit to them, give them what they want, go along with their will and so forth. They ought to be able to have power, influence, and rule over others because of their wealth. And it's easy for rich people to think that way. The thing especially that they're missing 
Paul said is, they've forgotten that the riches come from God. And that's the haughtiness that's above all a problem. When a person thinks that uh, he's, he's gotten his riches and fails to recognize that every good gift, every blessing we have comes from God. The ability, whether you're talking the mental ability, the physical ability, whatever ability is necessary to obtain wealth and possessions, that ability comes from God. And so it's God who ought to be honored, not the person who has the wealth. And there's lots of other passages then that warn about wealth making people haughty and proud. And then he says, furthermore, don't set your trust on that certain riches, but in the living God. Uh, so again, here's the problem that often people have with wealth. Again, he's not saying it's wrong to have wealth, but it's wrong to trust it. Don't trust. Notice he says, uh, don't trust in uncertain riches. The, the reason why we should not trust in material things is because they're uncertain. You never know when you're going to lose them. You never know. Jesus talked about in Matthew chapter 6 when they might be stolen or they, they rust, they corrode, or you never know when you're going to leave them. And so don't trust your hope, don't set your hope or your trust on the riches. Uh, riches cannot bring you happiness. Doesn't mean it's wrong to have them, but just because you're wealthy doesn't mean you're going to be happy. Many, many of the richest people in the world have been miserable. Doesn't mean if you're rich, you're going to have love, or you're going to have a good marriage, you're going to have respectful children. You're going to have loyal friends. You may not have any of those things and yet be rich. And oftentimes, riches become a hindrance to those things. You cannot buy, above all, you cannot buy a right relationship, relationship with God. That's not something that's obtainable by means of wealth. And so, he says, don't set your trust in riches, but trust God. God is the one who deserves to be trusted. God is the one who is certain. You can trust him. If he says he'll keep a certain promise, he will do a certain thing, you can trust him to do that. We have to meet the conditions to receive his blessings, but you can trust him to do his part. Every good and perfect gift. And so he's always there for us. He's always all-powerful, all-wise, all-loving, always concerned for us. Uh, and so we need to learn not to set our trust on riches, but set our trust in God to take care of us. But then in particular, he says that people ought to use their possessions to do good, to be rich in good works and to be ready to give, willing to share. In other words, uh, the possessions that we have are a gift from God, not to do just whatever we want with them, but to do what he wants us to do with them. That's what we call a stewardship. Ultimately, our possessions belong to him. He has put them under our control to make decisions about, but with the understanding that we're going to be judged for how we use them. And if we don't use them properly, then we're going to actually be uh, displeasing to God because we have not used our wealth properly. So if we want God to be pleased with us, not wrong to have wealth, but we've got to use it for his purpose. And in fact, there are advantages in wealth. There are good things we can do. That's what he's talking about here. We can do good with our wealth, with our possessions. We can uh, give and share and help other people. All of this is things we should do uh, willingly. He says willing to share, not grudgingly, but willing to use these things in God's service. And if we do that, uh, then the wealth can actually be a blessing to ourselves and to others. The danger of wealth is if we seek to use it for ourselves, to accomplish our own will rather than the will of God, rather than pleasing him. So we cannot buy eternal life. We cannot buy a good home life. Uh, we cannot buy many of the most important things in life. But there are things that we can do with our wealth that please God uh, according to the word of God. And he says that in verse 19, if we do that, we lay up for our, store up for ourselves a good foundation for the time to come to lay hold of eternal life. In Matthew 6, Jesus called this laying up your treasures in heaven. By doing good with the physical things that we have, we are setting before us an opportunity to receive the blessings of heaven. 
emphasizing that in our lives rather than the material things, that's what will please God. That's what will lead to the blessings of eternal life. So we thank you for joining us in our study here th today. Uh, we plan to next time to finish this chapter of the book of First Timothy, chapter 6, and move on from there into a study of uh, the Old Testament, a uh, study of the book of Amos. That will be our plan for next time. Uh, we we'll hope that you can join us and be with us. And thank you very much.